Hi, welcome to Big Mama's Kitchen and Catering. We've moved to our new location here at the beautiful Highlander Accelerator Building located at 30th and Patrick. We are still open even during the pandemic. We've made some changes and we are here to serve you Omaha's best soul food. The best way to order Big Mama's delicious soul food is to go to our website, bigmamaskitchen.com, click on the order now button, place your order, pay for your order, and upon arrival, park at any one of our four convenient curbside pickup locations, give us a call and we'll bring the order right out to you. You can also order carry out from Big Mama's. Park on the Patches Street side of the building, walk down this long brown sidewalk and come in through the west doors. Once inside, you come in through the door and enter, what, enter in what we call the dining room and you walk right up to our window and you can place your order or pick up your food. We're looking forward to preparing a fresh home cooked meal for you and we hope to see you soon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited today to have this, this young queen, uh, Dr. Cheryl Ingram. Uh, she's a native of Omaha and is the founder and CEO of Inclusiology, a diversity, equity, and inclusion assessment platform dedicated to the helping businesses build inclusive workspaces. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Big Mamas hey. and also uh, Best Burger and of course Dina's Place. Yes, yes. Um, please folks, be intentional and uh, support <laughs> our businesses in our community. Hey, and I want to make sure that I give this lady as much time <laughs> as she needs. I'm going to get out the way. Because it ain't about me, it's about this presentation and what we hope today you will learn, and not just learn, but take it back and have conversations on why these things are not taking place. So without further ado, Dr. Ingram. Yes, yes, yes. Well, what's up, North Omaha? It feels good to be back. So, so my name is Dr. Cheryl Ingram. I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. I am a diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist slash expert and growing. I've been a DEI expert now for 21 years. I graduated from Benson High. Any bunnies in here? Any Benson High bunnies in here? Ooh, somebody said boo. <laughs> get that, get that, must be a Viking or some, someone not worthy. <laughs> But I, let me, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is inclusology, but I'm also going to describe the journey that it took to get there and what it's taking to stay here. So I started, I left and went to college in New Mexico State University, and, if, and that was in 1999. In 1999 in North Omaha, I was surrounded by everybody that looked like me, right? It was mostly black, my family, friends, etc. And so when a friend of mine decided to go to New Mexico State University, it was a huge culture shock for me because my lane at the time was blackness. And then I ended up going to NMSU down in Las Cruces, following some friends. It was 13 of us who went down there from Omaha, Nebraska, all young black kids from North Omaha. And what happened is when I got there, it was a huge culture shock because you know, 51% of the population was Hispanic. And it was just a lot of different lanes. And my first job as a freshman in, high, in college in 1999 was working in the Multicultural Education Center. So I was working as a lead for the Department of Black, Progr of Black Programs. But mind you, if you've ever been to a multicultural center on a higher educational campus, they usually put all of the underrepresented and marginalized populations in the same building for programming. So here I was building partnerships with veterans programs, LGBTQIA plus programs, Chicano programs, Native American programs. And it was, it was me seeing the intersections of marginalization that were happening in the world, but also at a higher educational institutional level, because they also used to make us compete for funding. Now remember I told y'all when I went to college, I went to college with 13 of my friends. Only two of us graduated in undergrad, made it to graduation. Now, I'm a person who my mother trained me on how to ask questions. So do y'all remember the African-American bookstore up 
here on 33rd and Lake. Yes, sir. My mother used to keep me in that store growing up because she wanted me to understand institutional oppression because she had faced it most of her life growing up in the 50s, right? And, and you know, my grandmother and grandfather being descendants of slaves. And so I was always very fortunate to know and have access to understanding where I came from and who I was and to never lose that because my mother trained me to never lose that, right? And so when I got to NMSU, the thing that I noticed is that most of my friends wasn't going home by choice, right? They was having issues with financial aid. They was having issues with advising. They was having issues with faculty that looked like them. And so was I. And when I started college, I started in computer science because I started out in gifted science and math programs in high school and in elementary. And so when I went to college, I was like, I'm going to be a computer engineer. And then I got into computer engineering and my teacher didn't, her first language wasn't English. And I failed my first class ever in my life. And I was like, Can't do, I, I won't curse because it may be children in here. But <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? I'm, I failed classes, I'm here on an academic scholarship. So I took the class again and I failed it again. And I, it was to a point where I was like, there's something institutionally wrong here because I can't get a tutor that can help me and I can't find a teacher that looked like me and I can't find an advisor that looked like me. And, and I started to realize that most of the students in our multi-educational programming was having that problem. And so I was like, all right. So, so in undergrad, it kind of stuck with me that I was going to have to work twice as hard to be equally successful as people who didn't look like me. And when I got into my master's program, I started my thesis looking at institutional oppression in nonprofit organizations because I had worked for the Boys and Girls Club of the Midlands for 10 years off and on. When I would come home during break, I would work there. And then from 2007, 2009, I was a unit director, education director, unit director. So I was like, I want to look at the, non, the nonprofit industrial complex and how it impacts our people. Because even though I'm in nonprofit work, it seems to still be an issue with institutional oppression, especially for underrepresented populations, but specifically for me, black people and in North Omaha. So when I went back to college for my thesis, for my master's grad school, I had the mindset that I was gonna fix nonprofit leadership issues when it came to the industrial complex that impacts the populations that we often intend to serve, that often don't get served well. And as I, as I got into it, I ended up becoming a teacher's aide and I was sitting in classes and I was still seeing people that look like me or black and brown people fail in higher education. I was like, how do I keep coming back to these institutional oppressive issues? So in undergrad, I did my thesis on that. I studied nonprofit, studied the Boys and Girls Club, wrote that, et cetera. And then I got into a PhD program and all throughout college I had had a ton of issues with higher education, et cetera. I just wasn't the person I was gonna give up. Right, or, or walk away. I was like, I'm gonna go work three jobs. I was a Zumba instructor. I was working at a gas station. I was like, I'm gonna figure out a way to pay for college because I don't wanna go back to, and live in Omaha. That was my thing at the time. I didn't wanna go live at home with my mother and share a room with my adult sister. So then I, I busted my ass, I worked through grad school and I got into a PhD program and it was the most interesting thing because the, I, when I left New Mexico, I came back to Omaha. And here I was working for the Boys and Girls Club and it was just a ton of issues with funding, supporting black children, inequitable policies. And I was like, how does this keep coming back to me? And I'm, a, I'm spiritual. And so I feel like your calling never stops calling you until you answer it or you run out of time. Yeah. Right, and so I was like, this, is, this seems to keep calling me. And here's what hit the needle on the head. It was my aha moment. So I was working for this, this, this company or nonprofit called the Bridge of Southern New Mexico. Have you ever heard of the bridge? So what the bridge does is it would build early college high schools and get them funded in the state of New Mexico to address the issue of retention with Hispanic populations in New Mexico, in Southern New Mexico at the time. And I was their data analyst. So what happened is I went to a, I went to a luncheon with the president and at the luncheon it was the governor, the superintendent, the president of our organization, and me. And they were talking about how to save the economy in New Mexico. But you know the one thing that they wasn't talking about? Life. Human beings, mm. right? So I'm sitting at this table, here I am, 23 years old, or 24 years old, and I hear the governor say at the time, 
we need to create better products. And I was like, products? I, it's like, is he talking about people? And so the, it was the most interesting thing because I had, when I went to Benson High School, I had a history teacher, his name was Lonnie Tapp. And when I took his African American history class, we watched every volume of Roots. And when that man, that governor sat at that table and said product, it, it's, it had been 13 years since I'd been in high school. That was the first thing I thought of. I was like, who are you talking about? Human beings, like they're not human beings. I come from descendants of people who y'all haven't treated like human beings. And so he, he, the governor got to talking and I never forget the way my boss looked at me because he said, you know, they keep dropping out. And I just interjected because I, you know, have a, have a thing about speaking my mind. I really don't often have a filter. <laughs> and I said, I said, you're talking about human beings, right? He said, yeah. I said, why are you calling products? And he was like, well, you know, for us, we look at it in the terms of numbers. I said, but you, you can't look at human beings in terms of numbers, right? And then, then I asked him another question, and my boss looked at me. She gave me a look like, go to the car. <laughs> but I wasn't moving. <laughs> I, said, I said, you keep calling them dropouts, but what about pushouts? Because Michelle Fine wrote a book about, in 1991, about how students are pushed out of institutions. They don't always drop out of institutions. Now, of course, there are students who decide to leave, but there's also an untold story, a counter-narrative of why people leave institutions, whether it's education, whether it's the workplace, et cetera, right? And so I was like, what about the push-out rate? I was like, why are we not looking at that? And he said, well, you know, I, I don't think that that's our main focus. That's our thesis. I said, okay, got it. I was done arguing. Right. And I was, I was the person at the table who didn't have enough power to make an impact at that time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I went back to the building. I went back to work, and I sat in front of the computer, and I was looking at all this data, and I was like, how am I going to make this qualitative and quantitative and humanize the people that I'm presenting? Because at the time, I was looking at this data, and it was said to me, Every dropout costs the state of New Mexico $6,666 $6, per year that they drop out of college on average, how they don't contribute to the economy, which is millions of dollars a year. And if you go state to state, multi-billion dollars a year. And I said, okay, what are the factors? Right, so I started digging into this, this data from all for education. And in the factors, I was looking at the fact that many of those students came from low-income families and had to work. Right? Or, or that education, when they went into the classroom, teachers didn't look like them, curriculum didn't represent them. So I took the data and I put it in a way where I had a column that was all qualitative, and then I had a column that was all quantitative, and then I had a column that said potential solutions. And, and that's how I presented it. And at first, that wasn't how they wanted me to present the data, but when they got the data, they looked at the data, we got $10 million to start the first early college high school called Arrowhead in the state of New Mexico. And oh, wow. early, what a, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And what an early college high school is, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, is students go there, they get their diploma in two years, and then they get their associates in two years. So it's like a vocational program. And then they go directly from the two-year program into a bachelor's program. And the first year that that school was in, um, the, or the first year that that school was in progress, 100% graduation rate, right? But it was a rigorous curriculum. Curriculum represented the students. Like it made sure that their voices were heard. It was all the recommendations. And I was like, I'm down here doing this for these people. Why I can't go do this for my people, right? Yeah. And, and it's not that I didn't care because I'm a huge advocate of all underrepresented and marginalized populations, but the focus of the again came back to my skin. I'm so I said, okay. So I got into this doctorate program and I started to do my dissertation on how black students are pushed out of academic and social settings based on institutional barriers, not their own decisions. And when I was looking at the data, I was getting a ton of data about all underrepresented populations and how that was happening. And then it just kept speaking to me in a way that said, kind of what my uncle used to ask me when, when he was teaching me how to fight. What you gonna do about it? <laughs> right, I could hear his voice in my head and my uncle didn't beat me, y'all. He, you know, he wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't nothing like that. He put his hands on me, but taught me, you know, put your dukes up, make sure nobody hit you in the face. <laughs> and, and so when I was, I was 
when I came into my thesis and I started to look at that data, it was the most gut-wrenching thing for me. And I was like, how am I gonna fix this, right? So I did a specialization in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then I got a hard reality check, I hit rock bottom. So I graduated in three and a half years with a PhD, top of the class, one of the top of the class. And I applied to 448 jobs. I got two interviews. What? <clears throat> Right? Mind you, we in higher education as a professor, I'm also very underrepresented. And I was like, okay, maybe it's not meant for me to go into higher education because I'm a believer of science. So I got into this fellowship program that was the Dudley Emerson Ship Fellow Program in Seattle. And it was teaching underrepresented children, black and indigenous children of color, diversity, equity, and inclusion in curriculum and outdoor leadership. So I was going to help write DEI and curriculum. It was $24,000 a year. And I was like, I'm gonna take it. I don't have no place else to go. I don't wanna go back home yet. Let me go see what this program is about. So I went to Seattle. Now I lived in Seattle for five years. Great, I love Seattle, but also one of the most passively racist places I've ever, passively aggressive racist places I've ever seen. And if you don't know, Seattle is one of the whitest cities in America. I think it's number three. And it was the most eye-opening thing because I was in this program, and no lie, y'all, the first day we were in onboarding and we were sitting in a group and they had brought in a bunch of BIPOC, black and indigenous people of color to help run this program. So it was about 30, 30 people who were non-black and indigenous people of color, and then it was like 10 of us, 12 of us. So we're sitting around and the woman comes and she hands us a one page and says, pass this around, it's a handout. I'm like, what's on this page? So I open the page up and I look at it and it's their DEI strategy on one page. And I was like, is this like the succinct version? Or <laughs> is this the strategy? And I looked at it and I said to myself, speak up, right? And I, I raised my hand and I said, I asked questions first because I'm inquiry. I said, is this the DEI plan? She said, yeah, that's the entire plan. I said, first of all, this is, and I, I say this respectfully, the whitest diversity, equity, and inclusion plan I've ever seen. And she said, well, what do you mean by that? The statement is self-explanatory. <laughs> but let me break it down for you. I said, you don't, you're not saying anything about identities or intersections. How do you create a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan that doesn't address race, gender, sexuality, immigrant status, citizenship status, education level, et cetera, right? The list can go on and on. I was like, how are you not mentioning none of that? Either you scared of the language or you don't know what to do with it or you haven't researched it, right? And so she said, well, how would you redo it? Okay, well, my hourly fee, if you want my help, no, I'm just kidding. That's what I say now. Back then, I didn't know no better. So, so I said, you know, you need to, this plan needs to be rebuilt. And, it, and they didn't want to do it. I was in that program for three months, and I was getting ready to leave Seattle. I was about to head back to Omaha. I knew I wasn't going to stay in that program because it's one thing to present DEI. It's actually another thing to really want to change it. Yeah, right. Real talk. And so I started applying to other jobs. And the day that I bought my bus ticket, I got a call saying that I had got a job. And they had given me a bonus and it was enough money to get an apartment and a car and stay in Seattle. So I was like, okay, you know, I had, I had prayed on it, I had meditated on it, I was like, this is meant to be, I'ma stay. So I went to this organization called Year Up. Have y'all ever heard of Year Up? It's a, it's a technical training program for what they call urban youth, don't get me started on that term. <laughs> And ages 18 to 24, and it teaches them quality assurance, networking, and software development. It trains them for six months, pays them, gives them a stipend, then puts them in enterprise companies to continue an internship for six months, hoping that they get converted into a job. Now, this was one of the most eye-opening experiences for me because it was my first real interaction with corporate America. And here we were, I got into Europe, and my job was to recreate assessments to improve the recruitment and retention rate of underrepresented students. And so I said, all right, I can do that, I'm good at that. And I was, I was great at recruiting them and getting them in the door, but I wasn't having so much luck at retaining them. And the problem wasn't my problem, and I say that humbly, it was the fact that my voice wasn't being heard when I was making recommendations on what to do to support these populations. That went on for three years. You know, like, people, people love DEI, 
till they really have to talk about DEI, right? And, 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 and if you have to talk about a sector of DEI that doesn't make you comfortable. And, and I, I'm gonna say this honestly, because it was a lesson for me that I teach people now, there's a huge difference between being unsafe and being uncomfortable. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, so if you're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, to be unsafe means you are in fear of losing something, right? You are in danger. But if you are uncomfortable, it means we're just talking about something that's kind of foreign to you. But either way, people shut down both ways. Now, in DEI, it's more prevalent for people to feel uncomfortable and think that they're not safe. So, so here I was having these conversations again, and I was like, and, and what put the nail in the coffin for me to leave and start my own business was my mother passed in 2015 from cancer. And she made me promise to never forget my community. And I was like, okay, I gotta do something differently if I want, because I really wasn't enjoying life at that time. I was miserable because I was getting my ass kicked by corporate America and by nonprofit simultaneously because I was a woman, because I was black, and, all, and because I was extremely vocal about how I disapproved of discrimination and oppression. And, and I use those two terms differently. And let me tell you why, because discrimination can be good or bad. It's like, it's like the DMV discriminates against people who are visually impaired, right? That's, the, that's a form of discrimination, even though it's policy. But oppression is institutional oppression, which makes a policy that impacts an entire population in a negative way. So discrimination can have a positive or a negative. Oppression is always negative. And so here I was in the midst of both of those and really feeling oppressed. And I ended up starting my own business, which was Diverse City, which is my first company. So I own three companies. I own a diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting firm that currently has 36 accounts, 14 employees, seven-figure revenue, and exists in LA and is currently building a chapter in Omaha. And I own, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I own a production company called Courageous Productions that works to get underrepresented and people who don't get a chance to get in front of the camera in front of the camera and create content. And then I own Inclusology, which is my tech company. It's a software as a service that I'm gonna talk more about today, which is a diversity, equity, and inclusion all in one platform, which means it has surveys and assessments, it offers e-learning, it offers DEI certifications, and it offers automated consulting. And the goal of Inclusology is to accelerate your diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and teach you how to interpret data with an equity lens. Right, because I'm big on an equity lens. What does that mean? So it's like, let's say we go into a company, it's a thousand people in that company. Out of those thousand people, 10 of them are black. That's 1%. Now, out of that 1%, if I take a survey and I ask a question of how much do you enjoy coming to work, and 98% of your workplace loves working at your workplace, my question is gonna be, what's their identity? Right, tell me their commonalities and tell me their differences and tell me where the gaps are. Because in that 2%, might be 50% of your black population who doesn't love coming to work, but you're not paying attention to that data because when we look at data, we have a bias that minority mm. voices don't count as much as majority voices. <coughs> right? And so it's like, how do you get specific in evaluating data so that you understand counter stories, especially of people who are underrepresented, under-resourced, underestimated, and undervalued? And so now, I'm building a tech that does that automatically that's going to look for gaps in where your, that exists in your data through your assessments. And it's also intentional about not saying that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not a separate program in your company, okay? It is the DNA of every program in your company. That's the way it should be. If you're in engineering, you should have diversity, equity, and inclusion principles. If you're an admin, you should have DEI principles. Like, it doesn't matter where you are. It matters about what you do. And so, so Inclusology's goal is to teach people how to do that at an accelerated rate. Because we've been talking about diversity, equity, inclusion for a long time. Before me, that used to was talking about the same Right? And then that's in the workplace. So here I was, I built Diverse City and First year, one customer. Next year, 12 customers, it started to grow. And when I built Diverse City, it was on the premise that I wasn't gonna go into companies and do a one-off check-the-box training. 
it was going to be a long-term engagement that created sustainable diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. And so what happened is I got into that heavy and I was doing it for three years. It wasn't working as quickly as I would have liked. So here I was making small differences within one to two years of a company, but even then people were suffering, especially people that look like me. And I was like, this is not working fast enough, how I'm gonna speed client and we made such our first two clients and we made such good traction that we we ended up uh, growing 20 times for the next year so our revenue went from 10,000 to 200,000 in a year and and it was it was gut-wrenching for me because even though I was doing this work as I was getting better at the work the work was getting harder is this like this thing where they say the more you know, the less you know. The less you realize, the more you find out, the more you realize, the less you know, right? And so, so I was looking at all this data very intricately, high-end data scientists, et cetera, but the challenge was that as a black female individual founder, I couldn't get funding. So I was like, I don't have money to bootstrap this thing. I couldn't get a loan. What am I going to do? So I had to stick to revenue. I had to hustle. I've pitched. 196 times to investors. I've gotten six investments. So, so <laughs> I'm currently and still doing better than, still do, having a better success rate than many other black founders and that is a problem. Because if you're in a startup, you into VC, you know that the requirements for that within themselves are of institutional oppression. Especially for founders who don't come from backgrounds of middle class or we come from places of poverty like me. Right? And so, so here I was trying to figure out how to raise this money. And I ended up writing grants. And I ended up having the people who, I was, who was working for me was working for free when we first started. And half of my team, my found, or people who were my founding team, were people who wanted to do something great, but wasn't really built for startup, if that makes sense. And I say that with no shade and no cockiness, because entrepreneurship not for everybody. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that if you want to do that, you should have a pathway to create generational wealth. And if not, you should be able to work in a workplace where you're not mistreated because of who you are. Uh -huh. And so here we are creating this beta. And what I did was I ended up going into my, my consulting company and getting clients that I was working with to t take on our pilot and give it an extreme discount. So I found 13 companies that was willing to give me a chance because they knew me because I had been making significant changes in their companies because I've been working as a DEI expert. So they took a chance on me because first year, we didn't get no funding. And, oh wait, I take that back. We raised a family and friend round after we initially got those clients. We raised $60,000 um, to, to begin to build our new beta. And so I've raised three rounds. I'm currently raising my third. The first round, we raised 50,000. And then when I got those customers, we got those 20 customers, we started to see significant impact. I raised another pre-seed round, which was 
200,000. I raised 232,000 out of 200,000. And now I'm currently in the midst of raising a seed round and I'm at 670,000 out of a million. And the goal is to close on a million before the end of April. And my plan, my goal and what I speaking into existence manifesting is that I'm going to create 5,000 well-paying jobs in Omaha within the next five years. And, and you know, we, we're, we're creating a strategy that's built on doing that in a very non-traditional way. Like, great, if you're a college graduate and you have the privilege to be able to access college and get a degree, come work for us. If you don't, come work for us. You know what I'm saying? So, so now I'm in the space of how do I work with educational institutions and nonprofits to create accelerated certification paths in the city of Omaha, in the state of Nebraska, to get people to a place where we need them to be because as my company grows, so is the need for jobs, right? So how do I start doing prevention instead of intervention? Because I feel like most companies build and then look to hire people, can't find qualified people, so they go look for people outside of those areas, bring them in and then push people who live in those areas out, right? It's gentrification situation. So I'm like, here we are in the early stages. So how do we start now building that accelerated program for people who have backgrounds, people who you don't even have to have a college degree or a high school diploma to work for us if you're willing to learn and we have a pathway for you right now. I want to continue that. So now that I'm not telling people don't go to college because I hope to create a fund that pays for our employees to do that. Oh, I'm also God. in the midst of creating a social impact fund where even though I'm raising money, we have funding to give to entrepreneurs who want to start their own businesses. So last year, I partnered with Microsoft and we did a black entrepreneur expo in that building last summer and we gave away $17,000 to entrepreneurs to help them kickstart their businesses from North Omaha. And that was like, I was like, I said it at that program, I'm saying it now, that's just the beginning, right? And, and oh let me be God. clear, I'm specific at my lane being black people. But, but, and I am saying but, I'm a, I am looking to help all underrepresented populations and people who are willing to be advocates and accomplices to those populations. And so, so it's, it's a mission, it's a vision, it's a movement that I'm hoping will remain sustainable, help create generational wealth in North Omaha, grow North Omaha, and also replenish a lot of the things that we've lost in our communities. It's like the other day I was talking to Nigel. This is Nigel, y'all. So y'all like, who's Nigel? He worked with us at Inclusology. And he was talking about how he went to go get milk for his children at a corner store, and a gallon of milk was $10, and a pint of gin was $5. I'm like, do you see that the commonality there in, in how community health affects community wealth? So, so now I'm like, how do we restore health to the community? Because I ain't saying you shouldn't be able to have a gin, because sometimes when I leave work, honey, <laughs> look. But, but what I'm saying is, it's the things that have been barriers that have been created, visible and invisible, that harm our health, they harm our wealth, they harm all the things that, that our communities have once thrived on, but no longer have. So now I'm on a mission to rebuild that because I also think when the black economy flourishes, the world also flourishes, right? And, it, and it's not just about that, but it's about making sure that I see my people and all people, but especially my people, be successful. So that's where we are right now. You know, <laughs> man, give her a hand. I'm never speechless, <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to get up and start, and start shouting because everything that she was talking about, everything that she was talking about, I think every black person has experience. It's game changing to hear what she's talking about. And we should be intentionally trying to support her in any way we possibly can. So are there any questions that, that folks want to ask? I'm definitely going to ask you the first question is, how did this impact your mental health dealing with being in this situation all these years for such a long period of time. So I left out a, I left out a key moment 
that was game changing. So I had fibroids, as, as many women of color do. And, and I had fibroids the size of softballs in my uterus. And so what would happen is, during that time of the month, I would hemorrhage. Oh. And, and, and it, it had grown so big, and I was so stressed out at one point, I wasn't paying attention to my health, that I was at work, at the last job that I had before I was in entrepreneurship, and I started hemorrhaging. And I had to go into surgery within 48 hours. So you know, before you go into surgery, they put you in a pre-op room. So I was in the pre-op room, I didn't have no family in Seattle, so my sister had to take an emergency flight in. And as I was laying in the bed, I'm gonna hope I can remember, three questions came to me out of nowhere, because I was praying, I was like, you know, universe, God, if I wake up from this surgery, is there something I need to do differently? Like, what, what's the thing? Because I feel like this is a moment where my life is either gonna change or it's not gonna continue. And I had three things come to me. The first, one, first question was, have you done enough to feel like if you didn't make it today, you'd be okay with no longer being on this earth? Answer was no. Next one was, have you done enough to show your family and friends that you really love them? The answer was no. And then, have you done enough to give back to your community to make a sustainable impact to leave a legacy? The answer was no. And I was like, and then if something said to me, if you wake up, those are the three things you gotta change. And, and so, I am very spiritual. I meditate, I journal, I work out. And sometimes, y'all, that don't even work, right? And so it's, it's, mental health for me is big, but some of the biggest changes that I've had to do is remove toxic people who wasn't on the same path as me. <laughs> and, and also heal. So people don't understand that transgenerational trauma for our people is a real thing. And, and for me, I had a lot of anger, I had a lot of rage because of the things that I had seen based on institutional oppression growing up, especially in North Omaha. And so, so mental health was kicking my ass the first couple of years. And now I've gotten to a place where it's sustainable, but if you don't know, I live in LA and I live in, in Omaha, I come back and forth. I moved to LA because when I was in Seattle, that's where I used to go to escape because I needed the ocean and the sun. And it was like the kickstart to really taking care of myself and understanding, like, I don't eat meat anymore. I, I don't really drink as much anymore. Like, it was so many things I had to change. Everyday practices, my community, my surroundings, where I was living, the daily self-talk and affirmations. I have affirmations all over my house, in my office, because I need those things because I deal with some of the most difficult, discriminatory people you've ever met. And then I deal with people who are great and really want to see change. So I'm in this polarity daily. One meeting, I'm with, I'm with the, I don't want to say the enemy, the person who's refusing to change but wants to look like they're changing. And the next, I'm in, there, I'm in the meeting with the person who really wants change and feels like they're sinking. Last, in the last year, I've known two black diversity, equity, and inclusion experts that have committed suicide. That's a huge wake up call for you to understand what it means to take care of yourself and two people who have been institutionalized. Because it's hard enough being black in the world and it's even harder being black in the world trying to do advocacy work. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, it, it definitely does. Uh, we'll make sure that we give folks opportunity. You got a question? I know you're looking like you got a question. So what's next is, is the, the goal to create 5,000 jobs, high paying, comfortable wage jobs in Omaha without increasing the cost of living. And so, so I'm big on the fact that that's how gentrification happens even when our own people try to do it. And so to be mindful about creating generational wealth and also becoming an investor, um, financial investor in our community. Because some people say I'm an investor. I'm like, you invest your time, you a mentor, right? No, no shade. Um, but, um, you know, it's the difference between investing resources and investing, you know, wisdom, which is a resource, but they have different outcomes. Yeah, you know, so, so that's the next goal is to become an investor and, and really grow our community.
Correct. <laughs> That's a great question. So you need both. And the reason, yes, yes, her question was, what is the message when you're in a workplace and you feel like you need somebody that looks like you, but you're navigating the fact that all skin folk ain't kin folk, right? But, and, 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 or do you need someone who's on the same trajectory as you that doesn't necessarily have to look like you that wants to support you? I'm gonna say you need both, and here's why. Because when I talk about data, DEI data, I always 50-50 between qualitative and quantitative data, right? So numbers and content. So I think in order for you to really practice equity, and the reason why I say equity and not equality, let me tell y'all the difference. Equality means you treat people all the same. Doesn't mean that it's fair, okay? Because I could have had a terrible day, came in here and shit on y'all, but I treated all y'all the same. That's equality. But equity is fairness. It's about meeting people where they are, giving them the things and the tools that they need to be successful so that we can all get to an equal outcome. And the equal outcome is usually the standard for the person who's doing the best, right? So how we all get there? You gotta use equity to get to equality. It's like if I come to North Omaha and I see that the, the unemployment rate for a black man is 40%, I'm like, how do I get them jobs? And if the unemployment rate for white males is less than 1%, we have an equity problem. Okay, so the equity is, how do I give the black male unemployment rate to less than 1%? They are gonna have different needs than someone who might need something equal. You see what I'm saying? So it's accommodations at its finest. And so when you, to answer your question, when you do that, there's two things that you message. One is that you encourage people who look like you to apply for the job because representation matters, physical and invisible representation matters. And then it's a question of what kind of competencies does that person need to help you reach your goal. So if you say, I need somebody that's focused on the agenda of recruiting populations and making sure that it is sustainable and has done it successfully, that person might not be black, but they might be black. You want to encourage people who are not there to apply so that you can have an organic process for recruitment, but you also want to create a quota. You do want to say, we need some numbers, right? To create buy-in, you need both. And, and so the messaging is, I need somebody with these competencies, and I'm highly encouraging for someone that looks like me, but I'm open to everyone applying. That way you also can't get sued if someone says you didn't open the, the application process for everybody, you say, we want everybody to apply. It's equal opportunity employer, but I'm highly encouraging this population to apply. And then you go to spaces where those populations exist and drop your job description off. Because accessibility matters too. You know, I called a meeting, and I called a black folks only meeting. <laughs> um, and I got in so much trouble because I said black folks only. Mm. My question to you would be, do you think we'd have a conversation, honest conversation with <laughs> white folks in the room? No. Okay. No, no. And I say that, and let me be clear, because have y'all ever heard of employee resource groups or business resource groups that's like blacks at Amazon, blacks at Microsoft, blacks at Zillow? See, those groups, Employee resource groups, there's a difference. People are like, well, are they meeting the business agenda? No, sweetheart. ERGs are strictly safe places for people with common identities to create strategy to help themselves advance in a company, right? And I'm not against those spaces. Do I think we should have shared spaces? Absolutely. But you gotta understand that there's a space that people need to feel safe that might not require your presence to be there. And it's, it's not that they're discriminating against you, they're just trying to figure out how to speak freely without consequence. And people need those spaces. Whether it's black people, whether it's senior citizens, whether it's LGBTQ plus populations, it's like if you on a team and your team wanna have a conversation, you might not want your manager in the room. Right, because you might not feel safe with your manager being there. It's the same for social category, for social identities. You need those shared spaces. And so it trips me out when employers get mad. When they say, well, well, that seems discriminatory in nature. When an employer says that to me, I say, tell me your leadership demographics. If those are not equitable or equal, shut up. 
I love them. Yes, sir. What you do? I'm a software developer and also like Come on. Come on. So, so it's, it's, it's three, uh, top three things I need. Let me see if I can break this down. The first is capital so that I can create jobs okay. uh, for more people. I need some people in the educational industry who are willing to help me figure out non-traditional channels to get people skills and certified for, to be able to do that. And then I need qualified people to help me build and grow our business so that we can hire more and train more people. Those are the top three things that I need right now. And so, so yes, you could help. Because you know, I'm looking to raise another round and hire more developers. So let's see if there's an opportunity for us to talk. There's an opportunity. I think today. All right, all right. What's your name? Timothy Moore. Timothy, oh. nice to meet you. Hi, Tim. What's up, Tim? How you doing, man? I ain't got my glasses, man. That's why I couldn't see you. But uh, another thing, the, the book. Oh, yes, yes. Look, uh, Soul for Words. Can you talk a little bit about that and why was it so important to write that? So Soul for Words was actually my dissertation. I, I went through my dissertation process really quickly, but what I did was I followed nine black students throughout their, their college careers to see what the differences was on why they were successful or not in graduating. And so I followed three groups. I followed push outs people who had been pushed out of the institution, maybe because they didn't have financial aid, academics, or they were struggling, whatever. And then I followed currently enrolled students. I had three of them who were at different grade levels, graduate students and undergraduate students, to see what they were experiencing, same institution. And then I, I talked to graduates, three graduates. And so we did interviews, I followed them for a year. And I asked them lots of questions about how they, I asked them all the same questions. And I got very similar and very different answers depending on their backgrounds, what they had access to and what kind of privileges they had. But there was also extreme commonalities around all nine individuals, especially when it came to racism. And so we, what I found is students was facing discrimination no matter where they went on campus. So cafeteria, financial aid office, in the classroom, in the locker room, there was a time, there was a, a story where a student told me he worked in the janitorial services at the event center. And it was during Black History Month. He walked into the, the, the girl volleyball player's locker room and it was a joke on the board. On the board, he took a picture of it. It said, what's the difference between black people and tires? I'll never forget it. Tires don't scream when you put chains on them. Mm. Right? I said, how did, how did somebody think that that was okay to write on the board in a sports locker room and why ain't nobody take it down? And it's little stuff like that, right? Because if you black and you on that team, you walk in there and you see that, it sends a different message than it does to the rest of the team. And, and there are black players on that team. And, and so it was things like everywhere they went, discrimination was very prevalent, even off campus, right? Which, which led to our social settings. And, it was also the fact that there was no representation for cultural celebration or support. So you didn't have black barbershops. You didn't have black hair salons. You couldn't find a lot of black products in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So it was all of these things that just created this push that made people not want to, you know, to leave. And some people said, well, why did some graduate and some didn't? Well, because some people have access to additional support. Doesn't mean they're not all facing the same problems, but also mentally, we are built differently. People handle situations differently. It's like fight or flight, right? So, so don't discount the fact that some people graduated and say to me, we're not doing anything wrong. That's like saying we have a black president, racism don't exist. Okay, I'm like, man. if you don't get out of my face with that shit, I, I just, it, it is absurd to think that, right? Or that myth of meritocracy. We, we make it equal for everybody. I'm like, yeah, but that's not fair. And you say equal access, but what does that really mean? Not what you think it does. And so, so my book, Soul for Words, you can find it Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, shameless plug. But it talks about that. And then in the book, it's interesting, I created this, all, this what I call alter ego because the, the theories of my book is critical race theory and black feminism. 
Those are my theoretical frameworks. And in the book, I create this alter ego who is this black man. His name is Busara, which is a Swahili for wisdom. And in the book, he pops up at different times and he speaks to me about the challenges I'm going through as I'm researching these issues. And so he's like my conscience. And he says a lot of the things that I couldn't always express and write down or say out loud, but I put them on paper in his voice. And so it's like, if you, if you follow critical race theory, Derek Bell does the same thing, Richard Delgado, where they have these alternative personalities who come in and they dialogue and counter narrate with. And it, it was me telling the research, doing the story, and then walking through how to help these students with, with Busara. Yes, ma'am. I think so. If you know them, please let me know. But yes, yes, I do, think, I do think that Nebraska has a lot of funding that they don't always disperse. And I, I, it's interesting because I, I pitched to the Nebraska Angels. Um, and my lead investor is Invest Nebraska, which is down in Lincoln. And in the Invest Nebraska, I was, I think they said, I was the first black female entrepreneur to ever pitch to the Nebraska Angels. And I didn't get an investment from them, but I did meet a couple of women who have invested that are in Omaha. But if there's opportunity and pipeline for more that want to help me build and grow, I, we are open to it. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm definitely gonna give you my connect step. Uh, I think uh, we'll be very much interested in uh, uh, giving some, some money for this cause. Uh, this session has been so informative so passionate, and it really touched me in so many ways. And because uh, I'm a very outspoken myself, I get a lot of trouble, but with- <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> with, with my mouth and folks jump on me all the time and say, man, yeah. you, gotta, you gotta stop that. But if we don't speak truth to power, That's no right. one will. That's right, and silence is violence. People don't understand that. Like if you do nothing, you are a part of the problem. Right, so when people are like, I'm just not gonna take a stand, well then remain sitting, but know that you are contributing to the issue if you don't say nothing and you are against the issue. Because some people don't contribute because they believe it, but then some people don't because they, you know, have fear for safety, which I also understand. But it's still an issue of silence is violence and you need to say something if you see something. Yes.
Yes. And I agree with you. I, I think, and I've, I said it earlier, blackness is the lane right now, right? But I'm also open. But let me, be, let me say a couple of things. So we're not just the descendants of slaves. We're also descendants of kings and queens. Yes. And so, so we often tend to have a default that we only come from slaves. That's not our default, right? And, and I do think that depending on what kind of other racial communities you are in, there is discrimination that happens. Like gentrification very much is happening to South people, a majority, especially from Southeast Asians, right? But if you look at Northern Asians, there is a difference there because in Seattle, and I learned this in Seattle because I didn't know this until I had exposure to that community. Like Northern Chinese, Japanese, et cetera, are considered superior compared to Filipino, Indonesian, et cetera, who they consider jungle Asians. And I mean, no disrespect, but that's you know how it, how it is seen. And, and those, those populations are very much facing gentrification in cities. Now, is it as prevalent as it is for us? No, but it is still common. And, and so I do agree with you that we should take care of home first and we gotta reprioritize and our community should have enough resources to be able to take care of itself. And in some instances we do, but I don't think that especially as we look around and see other black communities, every community has those kind of resources to do that. North Omaha, perhaps. And, and, and I also think that you, you have a great point about how people who are all skin folk and kin folk, right? You have people in the Caribbean, et cetera, who may not have been the descendants of slaves, but it, let's talk about what oppression does look like for them. Like if you, when you say that, I think about Haiti, right? I think about, because even those countries have faced colonization. Ghana. And, and so, I, I know, but I, I get your point, I agree with your point, and I think that there's additional layers that perhaps weren't mentioned in the conversation, but I agree with you that it starts at home first. And uh, I'm glad you uh, touched on that. We, we have the resources to do what we need to do. I agree. Totally. But we're not doing it. So how do we, how do we get to the point where everybody's on the same page and I, understand that we can do this ourselves? Yeah. Because I'm telling you like this, I get tired of putting my hand out. Mm, come through with a word. I, on some real stuff. It, it hurts me. But I got work to do. Yeah. I got folks coming to me needing help when they get out of jail out of the pen or when they get kicked out of school or don't have a place to stay. Mm. Those things are every day. So until we get to the point where it's not about our personal feelings about one another, mm. but how we can impact, empower yeah. each other. It, Go ahead. That was a beautiful point. And I also think and in the space of granting my people grace, just because I give you money don't mean you know what to do with it. Just because I give you wisdom don't mean you know what to do with it. Or, or you know how to reach the certain resources that you need to be able to show you what to do with that. Right? And so, so it's, it's not, I think that when we look at the black community, we like, let's just fix one problem, it's going to fix every problem. That's never going to work. People need education. People need structure. They need to understand, people need to understand that when you are building generational wealth, what does sustainability look like and how do you prioritize supporting your community? Right, and, and, and let's be clear, because it's not just about that, but there's a lot of money that's owed to us that we never gonna see. Right, and so, so we can't depend on that, but if we gonna have a conversation about bringing other races out, it's like give back to us what you took if you wanna help us rebuild our community. So there's so many different avenues for uplifting our community that are so many different issues for uplifting our community that we have to address simultaneously and not one at a time, right? Because people are like, oh, let me just go out and register them all to vote. That's gonna fix it. Let me give a stimulus. That's gonna fix it. None of that work. Because at the end of the day, you still run in a system that was built to oppress us and still doesn't benefit us. So, so it's, it's a lot, it's a formula with multiple variables to produce generational wealth in our community. And having the resources is not enough. You gotta have the skills to know what to, what to do with them. Y'all remember um, Juvenile's, you remember Juvenile from Cash Money? Yeah. Remember his album, 400 Degrees? He got a song called Acting Like a, That Ain't Never Had. Have y'all heard that song? In that song, he talks about 
what it means to come from a space of not always having wealth at your disposal, getting it, and then not knowing what to do with it. Um, when we was brought to this country, our culture and our identity was stripped away. Mm -hmm. How do we get or address that particular component? Then you got to go back to the origin, right? If you, if you want to know about your culture, your history, or where you come from, and that's not, I mean, people say, oh, it's accessible to you. You can go on the internet and find anything. No, you can't for certain things. It's about finding a way to get back to your roots, understanding where you come from, consuming and retaining that knowledge, and then bringing it back and sharing it, right? And so, so it's, it's a process to be able to do that, but I also think that there's a lot of pride that has been built in America around blackness, and we've worked hard to do that. And so I think blackness has also, we have been one of the only races that have had to create our own culture here because of the fact that we came here as cargo. And so, so I think that you, one, have to open a, a trajectory for people to be able to access the origins of where they come from. And I'm not just talking Ancestry.com or 23andMe. And then you also have to find a way to take that information and share it with the people who may not have access to it or know how to get it. And the reason why I ask that question is uh, I absolutely agree with you what you just said. And we're working on a sister city initiative with Ghana. Right? Because once you go and you experience this is not an issue, but an asset, your whole mindset changes. We need to start doing that. Transformation, take them back to the homeland. See how much transformation happens with that. So, and you, you go into a community, you see centers dedicated to other accomplishments of races, but if you try to get the Malcolm X Center funded in Omaha, it's a problem. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like, how do we create a space that talks about our roots? Because when you think about Malcolm, you think about what he fought for when he went to the UN and he was fighting for the rights for black people to be considered human beings. It, it's, it's a whole history that we actually have here on soil that we don't support. And because we don't support it, people don't know enough about what that journey is. So it's like, start, if we're gonna start, start here, fund institutions like that so that they can help bring in that knowledge. Because they're already established, they just need more support. Mr. Leo Lewis. Hi, Leo. I always want to validate you as the president of the Foundation. This woman, when she first came to California back on the set of shop, she donated $500 off the top, and even $2 weeks. So just. Yeah. And hope to donate more. Yeah. Of so she's intentional. I am intentional about investing in my community. So we can't rally behind this woman, we can't rally behind nobody. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if you met. My name is David Taylor. Uh, I listened to you speak there. I don't know if you mentioned this before. What type of jobs that you were talking about bringing in the world from home? I was just curious you know, what specific types of jobs you look at. Yeah, so I'm looking to, as I build and grow my company, it'll be every department. It'll be human resources, it'll be marketing, it'll be tech. It'll be arts, it'll be all things creative, all things technical in our company. So I'm trying to create software development jobs. I'm creating HR roles, I'm creating sales roles, I'm creating community development roles, business development roles. So it, I really want Inclusology to not just grow like an Amazon and then try to take care of the problem. I want us to grow in the community and with the community. And so I'm creating jobs that are intentional about establishing relationships that build our product development and jobs that can help manage funds to disperse those back into our community. Those, those, that's the primary right now, and of course operations and all the logistical things that you need to run a business. I'm looking to hire all of those things. Wow, we ran over by about five minutes. Oh. I do, <laughs> I do apologize. Very quickly, y'all, sorry, last minute, one minute. I'm doing a talk on authentic intelligence. It's the integration of blackness into technology on April 20th at the Blue Barn Theater, 6 p.m. You can find the event on Eventbrite. It's free, um, so come check it out because I want to talk about black inventors growing up black in North Omaha and how that has really inspired and encompassed what we build in that Inclusology. So come learn some more. Yeah, sign me up, sign me up. Um, thank you guys so much. 
uh, and make sure you uh, be intentional about supporting Dina's Place, Big Mama's Kitchen, and Best Burger. And Real Solutions, thank you guys so much. I'm out. <laughs>